turn this nation around and once again make America's economy the number one economy on the face of the earth. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't be here tonight if I didn't think we can do it. I'm an optimist. You know, when I look at Fingston and Staley and Nagel and Red Paulson and Butch Swain on up through Arndt and Devon, we cannot be stopped because we are fighting for America. We're fighting for the American dream. We are fighting for justice and liberty and freedom for all. God bless you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Too bad he's not a farmer. <laughs> I promised you we'd have about five or six minutes uh, uh, for a few questions. Or anybody got a question of John? I answered all the questions. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> Do you honestly think they'd invite me? <laughs> well, I tell you, I have over the years talked to, you know, all of the farm organizations, Farmers Union, Farm Bureau, American Agricultural Movement, the National Farmers Organization. And I'll tell you what, I don't have one speech for one farm organization, another speech for another one. I tell it like it is at each and every speech. Any more? Yes, John. You bet. Our good friend here from Brown County, Minnesota, asked this question, what about the state of the economy in Minnesota today compared to 1973? Well, when I was commissioner of agriculture, I suppose you could say maybe I have been one of the few commissioners of agriculture that when prices went up, like they did in 1973 and 74, remember soybeans up to 10 and 11, hogs up to 60, I'm talking 73 now. Guess what, you're looking at somebody who said publicly to the Minneapolis Morning Tribune, WCCO Radio, this is good for America. And I feel that with those prices that we gained in 1973 and 1974, when farmers, you know, net farm income was 33 billion in 1973. And a lot of people said, well, what difference does it make? Well, I'll tell you, in the Middle West, in 72, 73, 74, and 75, because of those prices that were fairer than anything we'd had in 10 or 15 years, still not like they were from 42 to 52, but better than any time since. You could see the prosperity in every rural community and on every farm. But you know, the revenues came into St. Paul in such numbers, you know, that the state legislators had so much money they didn't know what to do with it. You know what I mean? Well, and for all of us who kept saying, look, if you, if you shortchange the farmer, it's going to haunt us. Well, you know, we kind of scotch taped it together for a long time. You know, a little tinkering here, a little tinkering there. Deficit spending here, tax increases there. So here we are in 1982, and I don't care what state you're from right now, almost without exception. What are we reading upon? Shortfalls, deficits. I just saw the governor of Indiana tonight, or say that they're going to have to increase taxes in Indiana if Indiana's not going to fall apart. We're looking at a, an emergency session in the Minnesota State Legislature tomorrow where they are proposing cuts, shifts, and some tax increase. And you wouldn't believe the rhubarb that this is causing in Minnesota. But the shortfall is about 400 million. Now you have to keep in mind in March 
There was a $768 million shortfall that they solved at that time, and I know they said, well, our problems are over. Here we are six months later, and it's another $400 million. Why? Because you people aren't making any money. And the fertilizer dealer, the seed dealer, the implement dealer, even that hallowed banker, they're not making any money. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, John Weefold. We're glad you could be with us this evening. It's time for another commercial. <laughs> one more? Okay, we'll allow one more, okay. Okay, for the commercial. <laughs> it's drafted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, Don Mack, uh, who uh, is... Uh, Head of our radio division in the home office. Uh, I think most of you know Don. Uh, he's been around uh, quite a quite a while, and uh, uh, the fellow that helps him, the fellow that you, that's the voice that you hear on the Here's Info uh, programs, uh, Phil Allen. We refer them to uh, into the office many, many times as Mutt and Jeff. You know, the short and the tall of it. But anyway, uh, I got to tell a little story about Mutt and Jeff. They were putting siding on a house, uh, uh, and uh, Mutt looks over at Jeff and he says, Hey, Jeff, he says, How come uh, you're throwing about half of those nails on the ground? Well, uh, Jeff, he says, You know, about half of these nails got the head on the wrong end. <laughs> and he answers back, He says, No, they don't. He says, They're for the other side of the house. <laughs> well, two men that couldn't take their job more seriously. They're professionals in their field. They do a tremendous job of putting those radio programs together. Don is such a perfectionist. I mean, he can take a wheeze or a cough or a sneeze out of a tape and you'll never ever know that it was there. We've got a kind of a standing joke around the office that if Nixon would have had him, there wouldn't have been any Watergate. <laughs> Don is going to introduce Phil Allen and then come back to introduce the radio personality, Jack Crowner. Don Mack. Can you hear me? You may not be able to see me, but you can hear me. Lee never told you the other answer I give to that statement that he says about Nixon. If that would have been me, there wouldn't have been a Nixon. <laughs> and now we'll be right back after this message. Commercial number one. Just like take one minute of your time, we've got two brochures back here that we'll have on a trolley in the hallway as you leave, and as also you can pick them up at the news booth down on the convention floor. It's the NFO radio brochure book and also a flyer on one side that says your responsibility in broadcasting. On the back side it tells about the agricultural radio news service the Here's Info. And of course many of you know how many of you have the NFO programs Here's Info three minutes on your local radio station. Raise your hand please. How many of you would like to have it on your radio stations? Raise your hand, please. Good, because we hope that you'll pick up these two flyers, and when you get back home, if you'd contact us after you've read them over, we'll see that you get a sample audition tape to take in your local radio station and help you get it on your local radio station. Now, commercial number two. 
How many of you would like to have a tape of John Weefold's speech here tonight? Raise your hand. We will have a special offer of a cassette that you can pick up tomorrow on the convention floor at Lee Elliott's promotional material booth for a low special offer of $4 per tape. Also on this tape we'll have Jack Crowner's speech and the banker's speech, James Harrington. This will all be on one tape or a combination of two tapes. We'll have a mass produced for you so you can pick them up tomorrow along with the other convention speeches. Now, commercial number three. And at this time, I would like to induce, introduce Phil Allen. Many of people call us Kojak and Columbo. <laughs> you probably know by now who is called Kojak. He's kind of like Jack Crowner over here. They part their hair the same way. <laughs> Phil? Yeah, really. I'll try to keep my commercial to the length of one minute, which is suitable. There was a rare moment at the convention last year when Pat Du Bois of the Independent Bankers Association, the same group that is represented this year by Jim Harrington, was making a very good distinction between hedging on the Board of Trade and forward contracting. There happened to be a very good question that came from the audience. I think Al Aiken, a South Dakota delegate, longtime NFO leader, asked a question about that about whether a banker should uh, give a special credence to somebody who has got forward contracting or hedging. And Pat Du Bois made an answer to that, and we have it on tape, just as it happened in this convention at Indianapolis. This convention, we're pitching for the same $4 bargain price. It could be very useful to you, not just because you want to hear a historic moment in the NFO in this public info seminar, but also because that's very useful that's going to be very useful at county meetings. Anyone who's putting together forward contracts will hear a banker who's had experience both ways telling about that difference. It also has the voice of Walt Hackney, who's dealt in livestock and knows livestock backwards and forwards, making the distinction. So that tape we also pitch. I'd like to say a special word of uh, thanks to Jack Crowner, who is in uh, our broadcasting profession. I welcome him, not just because we comb our hair the same way, but also Jack is one of the best broadcasters and the best recognized in farm broadcasting in the whole United States. And I, for one, am glad he's here. Before I introduce Jack now, I would like to say one more commercial. And that is, we'd like to invite as many of you delegates to pick up the news releases that Arlo Jacobson and the news department would be putting out every day on the convention floor and calling them back to your local radio station or your local newspaper every day. Now we also have facilities here what we call news actuality feed services to radio stations and networks and this is in the office right back of the NFO office on the mezzanine level at the convention center. Now, if some of you would like to have these actualities fed back to your local radio station, stop in in the afternoons because our phones will be tied up all morning long feeding out short news statements. For example, a minute and a half actuality taken from Devon's news conference this afternoon. And that news conference is also available and will be available on the floor tomorrow. And this is a good news conference with questions by television stations and radio stations that you can take back home to your local radio station. But if you would also like to have a live actuality fed back to your radio station in the afternoons, stop by and we'll see that you get help fed to your local station. And now, it gives me great pleasure to present Jack Crowner, 
from Louisville, Kentucky, who's going to talk on farm communications. Jack is a veteran of 30 years in farm broadcasting. He owns and operates a broadcasting service to 45 radio stations and three NBC television stations providing farm and news coverage in Kentucky and southern Indiana. He was executive secretary of the Kentucky Beef Cattle Association and after serving as farm director of the Orion Broadcasting Stations in Louisville, Kentucky and Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He also graduated from Michigan State University in 1955 with a BA degree in radio and television communications. Jack has served as president of the National Association of Farm Broadcasters of America. He serves as board of directors of the Stockyards Bank and Trust Company in Louisville. Jack and his wife have three children, Brenda and Linda, who are both graduates of Western Kentucky University. And he has a son, Mark, who's attending high school in Louisville. So let's give a great Louisville welcome for Jack Crowner. Gosh, those guys are little fellas, aren't they? <laughs> I want to welcome you to basketball country. We uh, take the sport kind of seriously down here, and I do want to be the first to, Phil, thank you, and President Woodland, all the NFO staff, <clears throat> for picking Louisville. Tomorrow you'll get a chance, I believe, to hear from Mayor Harvey Sloan, who just might happen to be the next governor of this state of Kentucky, too. You know, I, you heard my pedigree. I'm, I don't know as much as Dr. Weefall and these other fellows do. They're, they're smart hombres. Uh, <laughs> kind of makes you wonder what I've done with the last 50 years of my life. But I got some good memories of Earhart Finkston and I eating sausage together. Earhart, remember that? Boy, I mean to tell you. Orrin Lee came to town. We hauled him all over the state. And it's been a rewarding and certainly an, uh, a learning experience for me and farm broadcasting. I, uh, I enjoy my work a great deal. I'm not going to tell you anything scientific tonight. I left that to the experts and the bankers. I sit on a board of directors for a bank, and so I have employees like this over here, you see. <laughs> but Jim, we're awful glad to have you in Kentucky, too. We have, the, we have quite a town here in Louisville. I hope you ladies get an opportunity to spend your Christmas money next door in the Galleria. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? Gorgeous place. We, we'd love to have you here, and uh, th this is a good old town, and as I mentioned, I've been here about, uh, oh, 30 years or so, and really do enjoy it. We do have our problems, though. We had a guy the other day hauling some livestock in from southern Indiana, and a uh, pretty good load of feeder pigs, Lee, and... <laughs> One of them fell out of the back of the truck. So he, he didn't know it was gone, so he kept on going down the street to the Bourbon Stockyards, which is our big terminal market here. And uh, a guy saw the pig and stopped and grabbed him and held him under his arm. About that time, our county patrolman come along. He says, what will I do with this? He says, why, why don't you take it to the zoo? We have a nice zoo here in Louisville, you know. And the policeman thought, well, it is an animal. And so uh, he, he, he loaded it back in the front seat of his car, and the guy headed into Louisville. Well, the next day, surprising enough, you know, it's irony how things happen. But he saw this same car, the same man, the same pig going down the interstate. He said, I thought you told you, I told you to take this pig to the zoo. He says, I did. We had such a good time, we're going up to see the Reds play today. We, uh, we also grow a lot of tobacco here, and you know, John was talking about how agriculture is, uh, is new money, and it really is. For example, this year, we will sell in Kentucky about a billion dollars worth, won't we, Dr. Browning? About a billion dollars worth of tobacco. That's a billion dollars to the farmer. It is seven billion dollars to the federal, state, and local governments. Can you imagine that? 
The next time, the next time you hear people poor mouthing tobacco about its health problems and the bad habit it is and so on, you won't get Uncle Sam talking about it. He likes that seven billion dollars. Which brings me to the theory that I, uh, I get a chance to travel a good bit. I've been with some of your friends, old secretaries of agriculture and commissioners of agriculture, John. In fact, that's when I first met you, if you recall. One of the things that, uh, that I have noticed in, in my travels around is that uh, uh, farm prices are pretty universally poor, no doubt about that. And it kind of, I hate to get on the air every day, as was mentioned by uh, Don. I'm on 40, well, 50 stations now statewide, and it kind of makes you worry. In fact, I give quite a few speeches out across the United States, and I ran into a bunch from Kansas here a while back, Jim. This grain farmer, wheat farmer, he was said to me that uh, if prices didn't get better, he was going back to bootlegging. So uh, you run into things like that. Like up in Iowa, I spoke up in Clinton County, Iowa the other night, and the, the subject came up about hog prices being pretty fair right now, and what, $55 range, something like that? Pretty close for government work, I guess. But uh, they were still talking about the Polish Pope coming to Iowa. That must have been a real thing. I didn't get a chance to see that. But one of the old boys up around Maquoketa, I lived in Cedar Rapids for a while, so I know all those Irish towns, you know. <laughs> uh, I asked him afterwards, I said, well, I didn't get a chance to, to see the Pope when he was in Iowa. Uh, what did you think about him? He says, well, I think it's wonderful that he came to Iowa. In fact, uh, the Catholics have had him too damn long as it is. <laughs> well... In preparing just a few brief remarks tonight about farm communications, it's really changing, folks. I started in radio in 1951. I was the assistant farm director at Michigan State College, East Lansing, Michigan. I still own and operate a farm at DeWitt, Michigan. And I want to tell you this year, and I got to brag just a moment, we have farmed this same farm for over 60 years. This year was the first year we ever hit 200 bushel corn to the acre. First year. And my poor dad didn't live long enough to see it. Kind of reminded me of that song that uh, you hear about, you know, when Pappy was, was alive and he, he was always hoping for a good crop. Well, I know that my dad up there someplace was smiling on us this year when we hit that 200 bushel. If we could only get a price for it, though. It seems it's either fe feast or famine. I was looking through some notes in preparation for a brief comments here tonight, and I noticed an NFO meeting that I spoke at in Iowa in 1975. I want to go over just a few of the quotes and see if there's any relationship 1975 versus 1982. Well, first of all, I talked about an excellent harvest and crop production figures, generally favorable planting, some problems in harvesting with aflatoxin in the corn. Remember that one? Drought was limited to specific areas. Fairly good availability of farm machinery, seed, and petroleum. A vastly improved supply of fertilizer. I think we had a problem with fertilizer a couple of years before that. There was a trend to expand acreage, buying more farmland, more machinery. And the harvest trend to store on the farm, less at the elevator. Well, that was one thing we were talking about. Uh, moratoriums on grain sales to the Soviet Union and Poland. Seven years ago. The same thing is happening here today. Continued excellent export demand. Here we, John, we're getting back to your exports again. For food and feed grains, the Russians are buying because they've got grain failures. God, they have a grain failure every year, don't they? <laughs> Ever wonder why? Well, there must be a reason. Farm communications. We've got a bunch of farm communicators here. I want to talk for just a moment about how we operate. 19 out of 20 people, ladies and gentlemen, in this country tonight are not farmers. 19 out of 20. That's that minority that John was talking about. But you know, 20 out of 20 eat. <laughs> That's when you've got their complete undivided attention. <laughs> 20 out of 20. The same thing has happened to farming has actually happened to farm broadcasting, in a sense, and in farm news media. Newspapers, I see... No uh, Phil Norman from the Courage Journal is here tonight. He's our farm editor for the biggest newspaper in the state, covering your convention. But we see so many changes happening in communications today that uh, it just boggles the mind. 
When I got in the business some 30 years ago, we had no recording capability. Nothing like this. No recorders. If you didn't say it live and play live music, we did have records, however. But no tape recording, no videotape for videotaping television interviews like I'll do with Devon on Wednesday. By the way, that'll be seen on Ag Day nationwide on 57 radio television stations. We'll also be doing a report for the U.S. Farm Report, which Orion Samuelson does. These things are fairly new, fairly modern. You know, communications has changed just for you people. How many of you folks remember your first telephone? How many remember the first time you made a telephone call? Isn't that something? We have a telephone service in Kentucky now. <laughs> uh, we, we think a lot of it today, the truth. Kind of reminds me of this fellow over in, well, one of the counties in eastern Kentucky. He, uh, he had a, a fine wife, a nice family, and a sick cat. So John uh, decided that uh, he ought to do something because his wife was driving him crazy about that sick cat. Well, the mountains are pretty wide, telephone service very, very poor. But he got on the phone and rang up his veterinarian, who happened to be 60 miles away at the other end of the county. Communications were not too good, and so he says, Doc, I got a sick cat. And some of you guys have heard this before, I can just tell. I want to hear it again anyway, so it doesn't make a difference. So the vet thought he said calf, because he was a large animal practitioner. He said, what's wrong with your calf? He said, well, he's compacted. He's got out and ate something, probably, and he just won't eat anything. My wife insisted that I give you a call and see if you could do something about it. He says, well, I'm not going to come all the way over there tonight. Why don't you give that calf a pint of castor oil? John said, a whole pint? He said, that ought to do the job real well. <laughs> well, a few days went by, and they happened to meet in town. Standing there in front of the bank, Jim, and John said to the vet, he says, uh, say, Doc, that, uh, I'm glad to get a hold of you tonight. And the veterinarian said, well, did, did you do what I told you? He says, I sure did. It was, uh, I, I wanted you to know, though, that uh, I thought it was a little large amount. He says, well, for a calf that size? He said, no, no, sick cat. The vet said, you didn't do what I told you. He said, I sure did. <laughs> he says, pray tell me what happened. He says, well, the last time I saw old Tommy, three of his buddies came over. One was digging, one was bearing, one was looking for new territory. <laughs> now, <laughs> Uh, you may want to clip that out of the tape, I suspect, but uh, <laughs> I don't think it's fair to talk about somebody else's sick cat when I, I've got a cat of my own, and he's one of these fellas, he's about four years old, an all tomcat. I mean, he sleeps all day, and <laughs> about dark, you know, he gets to the door and starts pawing. You've got a cat just like it, I'm sure. Well, we, we had a family conference. So. Don mentioned I got two daughters and a son, and so we all met around the kitchen table one night, Devon, and, and decided what to do. And so I made the decision that we were going to take him to the vet. Well, uh, Linda said, well, i got to go along because you can't handle him, Dad. And so we wrapped him in a blanket, took him in the back seat of the car, and down to the vet we went. Linda, whose cat it really was, she looked at Dr. Snyder very, very seriously. She said, will Tommy want to go out at night after the operation? And he said to Linda, he says, well, Linda, he probably will, but he's going to go out as an advisor. <laughs> I'm glad they didn't call us advisors, John, up here tonight. You know <laughs> Well, let me just take a few minutes to be serious because we've got a real interesting speaker coming up, I guarantee you. But the farm broadcaster and the farm writer, ladies and gentlemen, in your neighborhood, in your county, in your community, you ought to get him on your team. Those people, whether they're young men or young women, know very, very little usually about agriculture. 
And you kind of get tired of having to give them a short course all the time about food and fiber production, but go back to the same thing I mentioned earlier, that 19 out of 20 people are not farmers. And we, we're growing a whole crop of youngsters that are a little bit, they're sharp young kids. They're very, very intelligent. And if you coddle them a little bit, show an interest in them, tell them some of the principles and the history that, like John did us tonight in regard to the history of the national farmers. The, the things we are trying to accomplish, the long-term goals of farming, the perils of weather, the high cost of doing business. But I think we need to present our information in a crisp and timely manner. And this is where I know that a lot of you who are really NFO correspondents, because your programs, Phil, are on my stations every day. I'm on from 6 until about 7.30 on, and then noontime as well. And Phil's right there next to me, about, about a program or two away, on most of those stations. But I would urge each of you in the counties to take an active interest in public information. Learn your organization so that when you can stand in front of your local church, service club, maybe another farm organization that's steered the wrong direction, maybe you can set them straight. Remember, the audience is not just farmers. That's the beauty I have found in being in farm broadcasting for so many years. And now the new dimension, let me give you an example of how just in the last year, my role as a farm broadcaster has changed. I used to spend most of my time knowing my counties, every one of them in Kentucky, about a third of southern Indiana. I'm on three stations in southern Indiana, one in Tennessee, one in Illinois, and two in Ohio. I try to get to those areas as much as I can to understand the problems and maybe help you folks come up with some of the solutions because nobody else is going to do it for you. I would suggest that you get to know your local newspaper editor. Drop in and have a cup of coffee with him or a glass of milk. Take him out for lunch, maybe if you can get him away from his desk long enough and tell him your story. There's so many things that you can tell about agriculture and farming in particular. One of the things we need to remind ourselves is that most farm magazines are controlled circulation now. In other words, the prairie farmer, the progressive farmer, farm journal, they don't go to anybody really but farmers. How are you going to tell the story of agriculture to the non-farmer if you simply work with a controlled media? And that's where radio, newspapers, and television can be a vital asset. We also find that broadcast being mass media has many, many strengths. But you have to get to know the people. You have to make an acquaintance with the news director. You have to really ask and be a little bit pushy, don't you, Phil, to get time on the air. It's valuable time. Sometimes it may cost you some money. But look, what I have found that most of our NFO organizations in Indiana and Kentucky have been very successful at is when you go in to start thinking about buying tractors and farm machinery, which we'll, you'll be doing eventually, not right now, but eventually you will, mention it to the machinery dealer that it would be awful nice for him to sponsor the NFO program or be a part of promoting agriculture generally. Farmers demand more information several times every day now, and you may, you may be coming from communities where that, well, for example, WCCO, they used to have a three-man farm department. I believe they're down to just Chuck now, aren't they? And he's on between 5 and 5.50 in the morning. You know why? Because from 6 o'clock or even 5.30 until about 8, they call that drive time. And they're going after those 19 people and forgetting about you as the one. That's the hard thing to understand. The same thing is true at other periods during the day. You wonder why farm television programs are on before the test pattern? Well, that's about where they are. And you don't have a, a leg to stand on because we have such a small, diverse audience. So few of us out there. I was going to mention earlier about what happened to me in the past year. I was called by the Ag Day people from Indianapolis to be a regional reporter for them, in which we will feed by satellite 55 television stations every day. How many of you had a chance to see Ag Day? Anybody? Got a few. It's a brand new program. If you get a chance, it, it's a pretty good program to check in on. 
What's going to happen down the road a ways? It kind of scares me. I don't know. I, my phone bill runs about 8000 a month. That's right. To reach 50 radio stations. I'm hoping to be able to get an uplink to a satellite so that I can feed them by satellite in the late 1980s. Finally, I want to take just a moment here to talk about something that <laughs> maybe I better not talk about. But you know, we, we hear about Social Security going out and being not properly financed and so on. The Social Security people dropped me a note the other day that I wanted to pass on to you that they are doing their research 70 years from now, which should be 2052, something like that. I can't add too well, but in the mid 20th century, 21st century, the Social Security people tell me that a trip to the supermarket could cost $2,000. Yeah. A loaf of bread, $40. A newspaper, a telephone call, 10 bucks. A medium-sized car, probably a Toyota, $250,000. A home, which a lot of our youngsters, like my daughters and son, I hope will have someday, will cost three to four million dollars. And your income, whether you work at General Motors, Ford, or on the farm, they're estimating to be one million a year. And their take will be $50,000 Social Security tax. Kind of makes you wonder, is that the direction we really want to go? Well, I don't think it is, because I still got great memories of riding a bus for a nickel and going to the movies for 12 cents. You mention that to the kids today, and they think you're crazy. I can remember, too, in 1946, we got 580 a bushel for wheat off the Crowner Farm in Michigan. You kind of wonder where we're all going. I'd like to be someday a thousandaire. Not a millionaire. <laughs> a thousandaire. Just brag about it, Don, for just a little while, you know. I ask our people in the newsroom at Wave Television what a million or a billion of anything really is, really is. And our news director over there said, well, Jack, we can tell you this. If you tell those folks over at the National Farmers Organization meeting, that if they gave, let's say one of you good-looking bald-headed guys, if you gave your wife a million dollars to spend at a thousand dollars a day, she will be gone for two years, seven months, and four days. <laughs> two years, four months, seven days. Then she'll be back asking you for more money. <laughs> How tall is a million dollars in thousand dollar bills? Well, if you start right here between John and me and start stacking them up one on top of another, when you get to one million, you'll get to my belt buckle, and I'm six, six. Now we hear about farm income in the billions. You'd mentioned, John. The federal debt next year could be 250 billion. That's what the federal debt just for one year. Red ink. How much is that? Well, if you gave your sweet wife a billion dollars to blow, kiss her goodbye. <laughs> now, I want to tell you I'm not going to do that because mine's a good cook. <laughs> you, if you gave your wife a, a billion dollars to spend, she will take 2,739 and a half years to spend a billion dollars. How tall is a billion dollars? Well, if you start stacking again, Devon, when you get to, you, we'll have to move over your way a little ways because we need to build a base. One on top of another, when you get to a billion dollars, it's 119 feet taller than the Empire State Building. Now, I say that not in boastful manners. Every one of us in this, in this room tonight come from a state whose agriculture is multi, multi-billion. Even in poor times, what would it be in good times? Which reminds me, I have a fine son. I think an awful lot of that boy, he's a six foot two, 15 years old. I think he's going to grow into a pretty good one. <laughs> but he's also at that age at 15 that uh, he, he's got driver's license on the brain. You know, you probably got a youngster like that at your house. I, 
Mark's a good boy, though, and we had a little conference about it, oh, back a year or so ago. And so we, uh, we did, had a little conference and decided that, uh, well, he said, he just come out and says, Dad, are you going to let me drive your 65 Mustang? And I said, oh, I think I probably can arrange it after you get your license. He says, what have I got to do? I said, well, I've got three things, Mark, that you need to do, and I want you to pay particular attention to this now. You may want to use this as a defense. We're basketball-minded down here, you see. First, I want you to get better grades in school. I want more A's, more B pluses on that report card. Secondly, I want you to start reading the Holy Bible a little bit more. We've got the Bible on that coffee table. I don't want to see any dust on it. I want you to tell me the books of the Bible and what Jesus Christ was all about. Thirdly, he says, what else could you ask? <laughs> I said, get a haircut. <laughs> well, a few days went by, and <laughs> I knew I was on barred time. Mark and his mother came in from the store one day, and I said, uh, well, how are you making, how are you doing, Mark, on this project about getting a driver's license? He says, well, here's my report card. Sure enough, he had quite a few more A's, and I was real proud of him about that. And I said, what about reading the Holy Bible? He says, well, I, I don't have much time, Dad, between trying to get to be an Eagle Scout and basketball team, but I spend as much time as I can. He said, you can ask Mom, and Mom shook her head. She always does, only son. <laughs> I said, what about that haircut? He says, well, Dad, I was going to talk to you about that. As I was thumbing through the Bible on the coffee table, I saw these pictures of Jesus. Jesus had long hair. He smiled at his mother, thought he had me. <laughs> and I said, well, Mark, that's right. You're absolutely right. But look one more time. Because every place that Jesus went, Jesus walked. <laughs> You've been a very fine audience. I want to again welcome you to Louisville. Have a good time here. Get a lot of things done and keep up the faith. Thank you very much. Boy, how do you top something like that? <laughs> Any questions for Jack Crowner? <laughs> Any questions? Well, if not, uh, it's time for another commercial.